a joint initiative of IIM Bangalore and IBBI. On behalf of the IBBI family, I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guest for today, Sri Ramalingam Sudhakar, Honorable President NCLT, and other members of NCLT, Mr. Sunil Mehta, Chief Executive, Indian Banks Association, Ms. Anita Shah, Ms. Anita Shah Akela, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Mr. Shubrata Biswas, DMD, State Bank of India, Mr. Debijoti Ray Chaudhary, Managing Director, NESL, Mr. Rama Subramanyam S, Executive Director, Union Bank of India, Mr. Aurelio Garia Martinez, Associate Professor, Singapore Management University, Professor Venkatesh Panchapagesan, I am Bangalore, Dr. S.K. Gupta, MD, ICMI, RVO, and other members of the governing board present here today and stakeholders who have joined us online. Before we begin today's agenda of the conference, I would like to brief a rundown of day two of the conference. It started with a panel discussion on insolvency resolutions, a special case for SMEs, chaired by Honorable Mr. Avinash K. Srivastava, technical member, NCLT. This was followed by thought-provoking research paper presentations by oodles of researchers, professionals, and policy makers. Day two of the conference concluded with a panel discussion on next generation reforms on insolvency, chaired by Honorable Justice Kaunin Ramesh, Judge, Supreme Court of Singapore, and Singapore International Commercial Court. We are immensely grateful to all the speakers and participants for their enthusiastic participation in yesterday's discussions, and we hope that the same will continue today as well. Without further ado, we'll now proceed with the workshop on data-driven insolvency research by IBBI. For this, I welcome Mr. Jayanti Prasad, whole time member, IBBI, Ms. Anita Shah Akela, Joint Secretary, MCA, Mr. Sandeep Garg, Executive Director, IBBI, Mr. Debajoti Ray Chaudhary, Managing Director, NESL, and Professor Venkata Panchapagesan, I am Bangalore, already sitting on the dais. Madam and Sir, we may begin with the discussions. Thank you. Thank, thank you and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, last day of the of the conference, so I can see a little bit of down <laughs> in the audience participation. But I think we will try to make this session as uh, interactive and as useful as possible for people who are interested in using some of the data that's coming out of this uh, important pillar of uh, our economy. Um, so before we get into the discussion, I just would like uh, Mr. Jayanti Prasad to say a few things as a chairperson of this conference. Yeah, sure. So good morning, uh, dignitaries on the dais. Good morning, Sudhakar sir, uh, Sunil Mehta sir, all other research assistants, uh, research scholars. So today we are having this first workshop on data-driven research, primarily at IBBI and MCA and other uh, stakeholders. So I'll just make few generic comments. Uh, I'm pretty new to the insolvency ecosystem, having joined only last year. So the code is considered as one of the important, most important economic reforms aimed at improving the ease of doing business in the country. The law being preventive in nature has instilled a sense of financial discipline and is bringing about a cultural shift in the dynamics between lenders and borrowers and promoters and creditors. The IBBI is a unique regulator in the sense that it regulates both the insolvency professionals as well as the insolvency processes makes and administers regulations for various processes under the code, namely corporate insolvency resolution process, prepack insolvency resolution process, fast track resolution, etc. It has also the responsibility of publishing information, <coughs> data, research studies, and also specify the manner of collecting and storing data by the information utility, which right now we only have one the NESL. 
and IBBI maintains its website where data pertaining to CRP and liquidation process and some other data is accessible in public domain. In today's digital era, an integral part of piloting a successful organization involves gathering accurate, reliable data that can be analyzed to gain greater insights, which can help in policy making. Research in the insolvency and bankruptcy ecosystem has been of keen interest to policymakers. The international IMF and OECD are, the, are leading the pack in promoting data gathering and dissemination to support research on insolvency regimes and their progress around the world. IBBI creates a lot of information by itself and also collects and collates information from the insolvency professional agencies, the insolvency professionals, judicial pronouncements, industry experts, industry bodies, advocates, resolution applicants, financial institutions, stakeholder feedback. However, currently insolvency related data is scattered across various organizations and entities such as Ministry of uh, Corporate Affairs, NCLT, IBBI, the IU, which is the NASL. The data regarding corporates are also available with organizations such as CMIE, uh, DICEL, SARSAI, with NCLT also intending to go online or on e-mode, uh, information would be continuously flowing from it, which wasn't readily available before. While we don't have a unified system at present, uh, which would bring all the data under one umbrella, or at least make uh, data talk to each other, uh, there is, the work is uh, progressing on IBC 27, where we are wanting to have an integrated database or a system. It would essentially support easier access and use of data that facilitates meaningful policy-oriented research. <clears throat> In the insolvency context, the availability of robust data enables achievement of various objectives. The data submitted and filed with the information utilities under the code may be a tool for early detection and resolution of stress, a tool for credit appraisal by financial institutions and support to the adjudicating authority in ascertaining the existence of default, which is the trigger point actually. More on this would be detailed by Mr. Dev Jyoti, who is the MD of NESL. The CRP regulations issued by IBBI list out various forms which are required to be filled during the CRP, such as Form A for public announcement, Form A for consent to act as RP, Form AB for consent to act as an authorized representative, Form B to prove for proof of claim. Form C for submission of claim by the financial creditor and various other forms. These forms are playing a vital role in collecting the data from various stakeholders and, and have simplified and expedited the insolvency process. More recently, <laughs> the live process related forms were also launched by IBBI to gather the information pertaining to ongoing resolution processes. The data is also gathered from insolvency professionals on a continuing basis. Since data is one of the essential ingredients to any research, IBBI has been collating a dynamic data set relating to processes and outcomes under the IBC, essentially to encourage evidence-based research at the, in the insolvency space. This would enable timely regulatory interventions and yield the desired result and successful results actually. <clears throat> Currently, IBBI offers a lot of data, mainly on its website being the primary repository. Quantitative information is available in, on CRP liquidation process, voluntary liquidation process and service providers as well. CRP data though is the largest chunk of the information which the IBBI currently gives out which also forms the core of our quarterly newsletter, the last, last being the quarterly newsletter for December 22, ending December 22. 
just to recap uh, till december 22 we had 6199 applications which were admitted for crp of which 4199 have been had been closed of the crps closed the cd was were rescued in 2298 cases of which 894 had been closed on appeal or review or settled 798 have been withdrawn and 611 cases have ended in approval of resolutions plan while 1901 have ended in orders of liquidation so resolution to liquidation is 1 is to 3 our quarterly newsletter also offers sectoral analysis of initiation of crps along with outcome in each under each process i think more uh, mr sandeep bhargav or ed will be uh, detailing those i would also like to add that ibbi has its uh, research initiative guidelines which are there which are first launched in 2019 and are available on the website this initiative aims to promote research legal economic and interdisciplinary and discourse in areas relevant for evolving insolvency and bankruptcy regime more than 80 different themes or topics we have indicated in the guidelines this research conference is second in the series uh, series where we had about 40 presentations on the various topics yesterday uh, we i have also attended personally few of them and uh, let me conclude by saying that ibbi is perhaps on the right path in developing a research culture within the regulator and by associating with the academic and research bodies of excellence such as iims and nlus in fact uh, the this association is quite a success story and uh, we have received even for future uh, international conferences we have received two three Uh, offers from different ians and nlus so i'll stop here and i'll let the experts uh, do the talking thank you thank you sir i'm going to go up there so now thank you sir i think you laid out the uh, overview of what we're going to be talking about in the next i think before i start can i just have a quick show of hands on how many people are do in this room do research for a living okay so at least some reasonable number of people are here who will probably benefit from the conversations uh, that's going to happen the next 30 40 minutes so i just thought you know i wanted to first congratulate both i am as well as ibbi to even have a session like this you know the concept of even data driven research in india itself is is as i think new <laughs> and um, and part of the reason why when we look up to uh, countries like the us and and recently china in the amount of research that has come out you can clearly see the correlation between what's happening in research and the kind of data that comes out from the different agencies there so i think clearly our first step which i think is a necessary condition for doing good research is having good data outside so i think in that i really want to commend ibbi and i think we should give them a an applause for even conceiving this in the first place um i think the the uh, couple of things um just from what um, mr prasad was talking about and i wanted to lay that as a sort of an anchor for our discussion one is this thing called policy oriented research um what i feel as an academic is that policy is an outcome research is about solving problems or identifying what is the cause for problems and i think if we do that right policy will happen naturally i think that's over uh, sort of emphasis on policy oriented research as in my mind diluted a lot of our research in the past including from stellar organizations like rbi and sebi and so on so i think one small recommendation to ibbi and other institutions out here is that please do not put those sort of an uh, overarching envelope uh, to what people should be doing with the data 
Because if we have many people look at the data from many different perspectives, eventually something's good will come out. So I think please keep that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, do is sort of, we have three organizations in the panel today, and I'm going to have each one of them talk a little bit about the data uh, that they are collecting. Um, but what I'm going to do is to set a, a little bit of context in terms of what sort of research happens abroad. And I, I have worked um, on bankruptcy research abroad, so I thought I'll bring some of that here. I think the first thing is, yeah, I think the whole concept of even looking at things like bankruptcy started with our formation of joint stock companies way back in the 17th century. So if you look at that, um, essentially, when you have the separation of ownership and management, followed by what we call as limited liability. So that's when you have things like bankruptcy, where if you have a, if you are an owner of the company, um, what kind of responsibilities do you have? Is there something over and beyond what is already been contracted out through your shareholding? So I think this is where it all started. So when we talk about research, we ask three basic questions or three areas we focus on. One is how are these companies formed? So this is where a whole lot of information or research that goes on startups, uh, IPOs, uh, how do companies get together? How do they grow? All those things. Then we are talking about managing the companies, which is where bulk of the research, I would say 80% of all the research globally that has happened in, in, uh, in companies is been in how do they operate? How do they manage? And the last part, which is equally important is how do companies die? And, and I'm, I don't want to be macabre in this, but I think the idea is good companies should sustain themselves and bad companies should be rooted out. That's what capitalism is all about. So in this process, having a mechanism for companies which are not doing well, which are wasting resources, they should be allowed to pass on. And I think this is where a lot of research has happened in the other countries in the last 30, 40 years to be able to understand what makes some companies overcome this and come out of the process of ban bankruptcy. So some of the elements of process, and again, we are relatively new in this uh, game, uh, in the bankruptcy game, but as I said, many countries have been doing this for centuries now. Um, in fact, our whole uh, concept of debtor-creditor relationships was originally conceived in, in what is called the Nelson Law in the US in 1898 that actually codified what a debtor and what a creditor should be and how should they be interacting when there is a crisis in the company. And I think this, a lot of subsequent legislation, subsequent uh, bankruptcy laws, all of those have literally taken um, from, from that Nelson Law. If you look at the process of bankruptcy, there are certain elements which are common across the countries. One is this automatic stay, which means the moment your company goes into bankruptcy process, and again, I'm using bankruptcy while we call it insolvency in India, but I think the larger question is bankruptcy is a slightly, in my mind, a, a broader concept than just pure insolvency. But I think for all practical purposes, we can look at each uh, both of them as similar. So the automatic stay, helps the company figure out what is the best way to reorganize itself and protect its assets for its creditors. So this is just saying that the asset should not be uh, claimed in the court of law during this process of reorganization. The US was the first country to actually come up with special bankruptcy courts to actually take care of this problem. Because until then, most of the uh, bankruptcy cases were heard in the regular district courts and you know the high courts and supreme courts. But what the U.S. did was because of the importance of this uh, process and the fact that you need capacity, they created it through a separate legislation, through a separate act of Congress. So that allowed a lot of cases to get resolved very quickly because you had dedicated judges. And of course, when it originally came out, there were some constitutional challenges, but then eventually what happened was 
the congress uh, ruled that these district uh, these bankruptcy courts are as good as a district court for all practical purposes then of course the resolution was as liquidation how much how I, because of the focus is always to resolve as much as possible and only liquidate in your uh, worst case scenario absolute priority rule so the, all of these i'm laying it out as something which are common or generic across country bankruptcy laws so the absolute priority rule is saying when you have uh, different claimants to the firm's assets which is going under bankruptcy you cannot have somebody at a lower claim get money before somebody above uh, uh, in line uh, in that in that process and i think this is and as you know equity is the is is the uh, security that is the lowest in that priority uh, queue so in most cases you don't have anything for equity holders the equity holders get wiped out in the bankruptcy process but in the us there have been many cases where the equity has managed to get something out because of the 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 fact that they are managing the company still or there is a uh, there is some level of control over the company dur during that process and this is where research has helped in fact um, a lot of research including my own research has helped figure out why there is a violation of this absolute priority rule and what can the law do to overcome that and the last is out of process mechanisms i think in india we have started the pre packs so pre packaged something which happens outside the process that can facilitate and speed up the process again a lot of countries have this as built into the process so this is the the overview of the process of bankruptcy i just want to talk a little bit about the orientation of much of the uh, focus so there is a legal orientation which talks about what cases what type of companies go into bankruptcy the performance of different courts and so on and then there is a whole lot of um, market orientation which is research which is focusing on predicting bankruptcies predicting some of the resolution process and direct and indirect impact the indirect impact is another very important part because for example because you have bankruptcies the kind of risk taking that the companies do ends up being um, very uh, good to the economy because if you don't have the bankruptcy process of course the creditors would be reluctant to lend because the risk will be high and therefore certain kinds of projects that the companies can take will have to be foregone because of that so the bankruptcy process uh, having a smooth process actually benefits the economy in the long term and that indirect impact also comes under research much of the research has been able to show how this works so some of the data that we have had in the in the in other countries is of course there's a whole lot of judicial data even going back to the 17th and 18th century where courts used to put out what happened to each one of these cases and so on but the important thing is the performance of the companies and the different stakeholders during the process so this kind of data that has come out in the west and now recently in other countries has helped a tremendous amount of understanding about the process and what kind of rules and regulations actually benefit the the most important stakeholders in this in this uh, particular resolution so i'm going to show you a couple of data of which people have used again just to set a context for our discussion today uh, based on what uh, uh, what we are collecting so this uh, lopiki database is one of the gold standards in the us it was actually started by a us professor uh, by just collecting data from various sources so basically what he did was he looked at court filings and sec filings which is the equivalent of sebi in the us so all that data they were able to put it together and organize it and focus only on the large public bankruptcies large meaning uh, companies with assets of greater than 100 million dollars and i think the kind of data that they put out just resulted in an explosion of research including professor lopke's own research so essentially it ended up having people talk about which countries which kind of industries are there contagion among industries when when uh, when bankruptcies happen and things like that and i think this kind of information 
is necessary for research and the information is in multiple domains. You have a reference information about the company, you have information about the resolution process, and you have information about the different stakeholder behavior. Like for example, I'll give you, I used to work for a hedge fund in the US. One of our strategy was to invest in bankrupt companies, you know, because the uh, stock is cheap, but by having certain stock and having inside information about the company, we were able to extract some value using certain other securities. I mean, if somebody is interested, I can tell you exactly how they do it. But what I'm saying is that the investor behavior, activism and things like that ended up having uh, coming out of this, some, uh, out of this uh, data set. There are other data sets, again, some are at firm level, some are at aggregate level. Um, I just thought as a researcher, and I think all of the people who are doing research will agree with me, when we get data from, uh, I would say, quasi-government institutions in India, there's always one fear, which is, what are we getting? And the principles that people use typically in a corporate setup, like what they call as data management principles, typically are not as rigorously followed in the government setup. And I'll give you an example where, suppose, let's say a company is going through a process, you have data entered, suppose something's changed, then the whoever is managing the data, they go back and change the data without leaving any sort of audit trail that the original data was there and then subsequently it was changed at such and such a time because of such and such a reason. See, from a researcher point of view, if I had started doing research using my older version of the data and then if somebody tries to replicate it with the newer data, they won't find the same results. So I think that concept of data integrity is absolutely critical. So I'm, I, I actually request the, the panelists here to make sure that there are dedicated data management team members to be able to take this data and protect the integrity and the quality of the data. And of course, we need a whole lot of other things. And one more thing I'll just emphasize before I move on, which is the ability to merge data. And as you see today in, in the panel, we have three sources of data and each one looking at different parts of the puzzle. So it is important for a researcher to be able to connect them. Of course, researcher will do the connection, but they should be able to do it. So which means there has to be some variable or something which I can use to connect. Because if it is not possible, then most of the research effort will be spent on just on the data itself and less on the insights. So I think, Maybe it's some coordination mechanism whereby they sit together, understand what principles to use across the board, identify what are the common identifiers that we can use. Everybody uses the same with the same definition. Then I think the quality of the data that comes out will be phenomenal. And then after that, it's up to the researcher to take it forward. Some of the areas, this is based on what we have picked up from the US. Um, where I've worked a little bit more, so I have a little bit more uh, uh, information there. So things like, for example, information disclosure. So for example, if you look at SEBI today, SEBI is all about disclosure. Anything they don't like, immediately they'll ask the company to disclose, not realizing whether it is makes sense, not make sense, whether people actually read it. So I think the point is, if we can connect the information relative to the risk of the company, and link it up to the probability of companies going into bankruptcy, then maybe there is some uh, insights that we can draw on whether this information disclosure really works or not, or whether SEBI should be doing something else. Similarly, the contagion effects that I saw, which is one industry getting affected by a few large companies going bankrupt, and then immediately, you know, the upstream, downstream uh, firms are also under subject to bankruptcy risk. Um, investor behavior, managerial risk taking, uh, clearly, uh, if uh, in the US, for example, it is guaranteed. I would say I think about 90% of the time when a company goes into bankruptcy, the management is fired. So the entire new management comes in. While in India, it's just the opposite. So we are struggling with the idea of what to do with the debtor, you know. So I think that concept itself, we have a lot to work on and a lot to figure out from research. 
as to what is the what is the secret sauce in what is the management bringing to the table can we replicate it because clearly having the debtor in place is i mean from from outside optics point of view it is not a good thing for the creditors because here is the person who has actually forced the creditors to take a cut so and lastly the cross country comparisons now that we have uh, a good bankruptcy law in pro in place we have data we could now start looking at our performance relative to other countries like for example uh, some of the european countries some of the us country i mean us and also some of the uh, the the asian countries that are closest to us so i think this is where i thought you know i leave it so this is one of my own papers where we looked at lopiki data um, i want to now bring the panelists back in so the plan is we will have the panelists talk a little bit about their data and then we'll have some discussions and more importantly i want some questions from you guys to to be able to ask them um, so the goal or the takeaway of this session should be that we know what data is being collected in the bankruptcy and the fact that we know how to get it and we know the roughly we know the quality of that data so if we can get to that state i think this session should be uh, relatively a, a success in my mind all right thank you so i want to now bring the panelists back um so first is i want um, mr deep jyoti to start by talking a little bit about information utility company the concept itself the company that has been set up because this is very unique to india and follow it up with the data that he, he and his company is collecting so need to change this first of all i would like to thank uh, ibbi and imb for having me as part of this very distinguished panel it's my pleasure to be here honorable prime minister shri narendra modi ji has said that this is india's amrit kal and in amrit kal the world will take directives from india ipi is a unique indian innovation we have the sbi bond the world we did the first cross border transaction under upi a couple of days back i or information utility is another indian innovation the ibpi website states that there is no institution comparable to the iu anywhere in the world so what is it so unique about the iu there are many aspects but so session is in research i would focus on how this can facilitate researchers professor venkatesh talked about audit trail quality of data let us see how the design of the iu ensures this when data is submitted to the information utility typically it's a bank which submits information about the debtor the iu process design ensures that this information is presented for authentication the data has three options he can dispute it he can accept it and there's third option which is likely to be addressed in the recent amendment of the code he can also choose to ignore it 
But even without this amendment in the law, there has been a recent judgment which states that if a debtor chooses to ignore a request for authentication sent by a creditor, then at a later date, he cannot dispute the existence of the debt. So what does it signify for the researcher? He's clear as to what the status of the data. Is it disputed? If it's disputed, he can segregate it. He also knows that what portion of the data has either been accepted or the data has seen it, but he has not disputed it. So he has that clarity of thought as to how authentic the data is. Another important aspect, the I sends notifications about various life cycle events in the insolvency process and equally important for it. So when a default is reported by a creditor about a debtor, I does the process of authentication as provided in the code. I mean, the insolvency and bankruptcy code. After completion of the process of authentication, two significant things happen. Firstly, a record of default is issued. Based on this record of default, the creditor can initiate insolvency proceedings. But equally important, an email is also sent. We'll come to the presentation. Let me just speak, then we'll come to the presentation. So, uh, equally important, uh, default notification is also sent to all creditors of the data. So, let me just clarify. A default is reported by one creditor about a data, but a notification goes to all creditors of the data. And this is one of the design of the IO, which is to reduce information asymmetry. So all creditors are aware that there is default by a data to one creditor. So all creditors are on the same plane as far as information is concerned. Now, what is this of significance? For a researcher. As per our data, 79 instances of record of default have been issued. This pertains to around 30,000 corporate debtors. Interestingly, out of this 30,000, only 18,000 have been subject to insolvency process. So the question arises, what has happened to the remaining? That is for the researcher, but there are a couple of possibilities. One, the most obvious one is possible that an application has been filed. It is still being examined by the honorable NCLT for admission. Second possibility, which is not very good, is that insolvency has not been initiated, but the stress is lingering on, which is not good. We all know that the longer the stress lasts, the, long, the more there's depreciation in value of the city. And the third, which is optimistic way of looking at things, it's possible that the creditors and debtors have come to a, some kind of a settlement outside of the insolvency process. So there are three possibilities, and it is only a research can find out what ex exactly happened. 
So now, if you permit, I'll just go to the Kutubu present presentation. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. If you have a record in this but so what happened to the body? So this is some geographical analysis we have attempted based on the data that has interesting and possibly it might seem obvious also Maharashtra then account for the largest number of corporate debtors. And their share of debt outstanding is 30% and 18%. So two states account for almost 50% of all the debt. Another interesting dimension is the default. Does default have some geographical correlation? Apparently, there are a couple of states where the default is slightly high. And when I'm referring to this default percentage, it's the percentage of the debt outstanding in that particular state. So, for example, if you see Maharashtra, it accounts for 30% of all the debt. But in Maharashtra, the default rate is only 9%, whereas it's slightly higher than the other states. Again, we try to segregate the default rate into various bands. And we find that in certain states, the default rate is slightly higher. In the fourth category, for example, 20%, the default rate is 20%, and number of states in the bank are 10. And the overall share is in the debt is not much, it's only 10%. In the second category, larger states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, they account for 71% of all the debt, but the default rate in these states is much lower at 10%. This is, uh, we use the MCA database, the first column of all active companies as per MCA database, unique cities, and we try to find out the percentage of firms which have debts reported to, to IU. So we just try to see. Uh, whether this access to debt also has some state-wise correlation. Not major, but we do find in some states, like for example, Gujarat, it's around 25%, which is slightly higher than the national average. This study we try to do based on the NCT benches and the default rate. And the weight here is that here we might try to analyze it based on the IBC threshold of one crore. So that analysis has also been done separately, but the overall trend is the same. But in Mumbai, Delhi, the number of unique debtors with default are higher compared to others. So these are some facts about firm indebtedness. And we found that the larger firms have 60% of all the debt in the universe. And progressively, as it comes down, the access to debt uh, comes down substantially. This data includes the venture firms also. If you see the, the next slide, there's the same analysis after excluding the venture finance. So here it's slightly more capable, but even then we find that it's larger states, larger companies, which are able to get most of the finance. This is a very interesting data point. It shows that as the size of a company increases, the access to debt also improves. So if you see the companies which have debt of more than 5,000 crores, Average number of loan accounts are more than 400, and the average size of the debt is also goes up substantially. In fact, uh, we see in the uh, when, uh, in the bank, in the higher bank, the rise is almost exponential. So 
So this we try to find the default rate across various categories or various bands of debt. And uh, in the larger category, five thousand crore, the default rate is slightly higher. In the category one to two, it may seem higher, but this may not uh, be true reflection because uh, since the IBC threshold is then one crore, so much of the data below one crore does not get reported to value. So the higher default rate of twenty-seven percent in the up to one crore category needs to be seen in that context. I think that's all I have to present. And just two caveats. Uh, one is these are not conclusions; these are only questions which have to be taken to the logical conclusion. Secondly, IU is not a public credit repository. Access to the IU is only to authorized persons. So any access to data, access to this data, for researchers. Has to be with the permission of IBP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I think, uh, I think the last statement is probably most valuable to all of us here. <laughs> so, um, so you have to also tell us how to apply and what the process is. But I would like to now invite Ms. Anita to come in and talk a little bit about the MCA data, which is, as you know. It's huge and very important data. Still, they sort that out. Can use this. <coughs> So a very good morning to all of you. I hope I'm audible. So uh, we'll start today as to what we do in MTA Ministry of Corporate Affairs. We have a lot of data available with us. At the outset, let me thank IBBI and IIM Bangalore for making it possible for us to be here. So my uh, outline of my presentation is I'm going to just speak a little about the schema of data maintained by the IBC stakeholders. Uh, who are our stakeholders? What is the data and different system that we maintain? What is the vision that we have in order to integrate all this data? What are the advantages that we are looking at when once the data is integrated? What is the process flow and case management module that we are looking at in the proposed IT platform? And how we propose to leverage the latest technologies like AI, etc. Now, uh, coming to the stakeholders of the IBC system, we've got the parliament, which is the lawmaker, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, the adjudicating authority, that is the National Company Law Tribunal and the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. We've, of course, got the IBBI, the insolvency professional agencies, information utility that you've just heard about, re registered valuers, organizations, insolvency professionals, registered valuers, debtors, creditors, investors, etc. 
this entire thing makes up the ecosystem of the IBC. Now we have data in different different systems. Currently, the data is not integrated in any one place. For example, you've got the NCLT portal, which is using the e codes module. They have certain data, they do not have certain data. Some of the data is captured. What is captured is the status of the cases, online orders, a bit of the case management. There is a lot of potential that every aspect of the data should be captured, but that is still not being done. Then we've got the MCA portal, that is the MCA 21 portal. Now, let me just tell you something, uh, just a brief guy, uh, uh, brief outline of what MCA 21 is all about. Now, this was India's first uh, mission mode project, which was launched probably in the year uh, 2006. This was under the National E-Governance Plan. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs was responsible for this project. And all the private and public companies uh, were supposed to be making their filings into the MCA 21. Initially, what used to happen is that every company, I don't know how many of you would have heard of it, that we have a registrar of companies in each of the cities. And then we have a regional director. So mergers, acquisition, any data, annual filing, everything people used to, in fact, there used to be certain dates by which these returns have to be filed and people had to queue up in long queues overnight, probably sometime in order to ensure that their data, is, uh, their uh, records are filed on time physically. So in order to ease this and for the purpose of ease of doing business in 2006, MCA 21 portal was launched whereby you could do all these filings online. <clears throat> Now, uh, our data set at MCA 21 can, has about 1.8 million firms, which include both public as well as private, listed as well as unlisted. In fact, you would get information from other others like CMI, Proves, Capital In, etc. You There are other sources of data also, but MCA is the largest source of data. And uh, we have all the firm level data also available. These are all self-declared. There is no uh, analysis done further. There are some straight through processes and somewhere some uh, data is again checked. Straight through is where the data is filed. It is trust based. We trust you for the data that is filed and that is taken into our system. Now given, and then we also have this uh, XBRL and non-XBRL filings which were allowed. XBRL is the extensible business reporting language which is the language for electronic communication of the business and financial data. So as a result of this, we have a humongous amount of data and all of them guided by rules, parameters, etc. Now, uh, how do we obtain this data? This data is used for various research purposes. So on the MCA website, you would find something called as the guidelines for obtaining the data from the MCA 21 by researchers and research proposals. So we do uh, do a funding of this kind of research and uh, data is also provided by MCA. There is a cost to uh, obtaining this data. For example, between zero to 5,000 companies, probably the cost for individual researchers would be about 5,000 rupees and for institutional would be 10,000 rupees and there would be some small add-on cost. So this data can be obtained from MCA 21. There is an application form which is available online and an MOU has to be signed. Now, how and what form this data is maintained? There is a guide implementation guideline on data sharing and it is on two uh, broad frameworks that is shareable and non-shareable data. Now, sensitive data shall be provided only against an authorized request on a case-to-case -case basis and after a non-disclosure agreement has been entered into. And for structured regular data, the exchange, the requester shall enter into a specific MOU with the MCA for that purpose. Now we have a certain set of list, what data can be shared, what cannot be shared. We have a negative list, which has got non-shareable data. Mostly these are the cost audit reports, which are, which are uh, categorized as highly confidential information, as it has got several production related details, etc. And then as per the IT Act uh, 2000, which was amended in 8, 
personal information, personally identifiable information data, which is categorized as highly sensitive. This is also not shared, and this is in the negative list. Thereafter, we have the sensitive data. Sensitive data as, very, as given as per various acts and rules of the government of India. Now, what do we have as sensitive data? We have data that comes into existence through enforcement functions of the MCA, data generated as a part of internal analysis using MCA's enforcement functions, internal tools, risk analysis, investigations, intelligence, etc. These are sensitive data. Then data pertaining to the configuration of the technology of MCA's IT system. And we have a corporate data management unit also, which I'll speak about in a while. Then this is also sensitive. Forensic data, which is available in MCA's IT system, such as signatures, etc., is also considered to be sensitive. Data provided by MCA to other government organizations with whom we have executed any MOU or non-disclosure agreement, that is sensitive. Third party granular transaction data, uh, which is supplied by various other regulators, that also is sensitive. Information of data received under any international treaty agreement is also classified as sensitive data. Thereafter, we have something called as a restrictive data, such as company reports, alerts, validation, provisional reports, which are available on our corporate management, uh, corporate data management portals. And these are under the restricted uh, category. Access to this data is through a prescribed process of registration and authorization by the MCA. Then we have the shareable data, which is the information contained in all the other returns, application documents, and that can be shared with the general public policy decision by the public, uh, by the board, etc., which can be shared. So all this kind of data is already readily available on the website. The MCA may at its discretion decide to openly publish any data which it feels is in the interest of transparency and good. So to just give you an illustrative list, we have the financial aggregate for primarily which we utilize for policy making, research and analysis by suppressing individual company specific information. For instance, uh, if you are looking at the fertilizer prices, if a policy call has to be taken on increasing the fertilizer prices or reducing the subsidy as the case may be. So cost data analysis, cost data is taken and uh, each of the fertilizer category, how the companies are working. So we utilize, we give that data to the concerned ministry, which takes a policy call on this. Then we have categorization as per the economic activity, private, public, government, non-government, listed, unlisted, state of registration, all the financial parameters recorded in the balance sheet, profit and loss accounts, etc. And already disseminated data, which is already available in the public domain, like published reports, PUC-based reports, uh, RBI reports, etc., which have, have been shared. Then we also have the non-financial aggregates, such as the number of new companies which have been registered, working companies, foreign companies, companies under liquidation, closure, merger, etc. Then we have the conversion of private limited companies into public limited companies, public into private limited, and companies into LLP. So this is the humongous amount of data that we have with us. And this is all available to the researchers. So, as I said about the MCA portal, this is the data that is available. Then you have the IBBI's portal, which is the regulator's data depository, which Sandeep will be talking more in detail about. You've got the announcement, EOIs, auction, professionals and processes, IP registration, monitoring complaints, etc. Then you have the IPA or the values portals, where you have the member registration, the compliances, disclosures. Then, of course, you have the NESL portal, which has already been discussed. Now, this data is in different, different IT systems. Uh, there is no single identifier which is going to help you to link all this data. This is what we noticed. However, the potential inputs that we can take from the MCA21 is to design an early warning system. The MCA21 database can provide specific data points that can be used to develop these early warning systems like financial ratios, like debt to equity ratio, inter interest coverage ratio, operational indicators like inventory turnover, day sales outstanding, audit qualification and internal control deficiencies reported in the company's financial statement, changes in the key management person personnel, the corporate governance effect, late filings, etc. 
then we can also look at the sectors which uh, sectors or industries which are prone to financial stress due to policy decisions like the number of companies in a particular sector that have filed for insolvency or or have undergone restructuring for example real estate sometimes has been seen in at some points in time at some points in time you see some other companies the to then we also look at the total amount of debt outstanding in a particular sector average time taken for insolvency resolution in a particular sector recovery rate of creditors in a particular sector changes in valuation etc then there is a caro report which is the statutory report prepared by the auditor of the company which raises green, green flags it can provide valuable input to the policy making the auditor's assessment of company's ability to uh, go on as a going concern the adequacy and effectiveness of the com company's internal controls and risk management system their assessment of the company's financial reporting the compliances and the debt servicing ability the nclt ibbi data we have to have, we require it to look at the outcomes of the ibc process whether our process is running fine what is the feedback loop that we are getting where we need to make changes how we need to improve what are the bottlenecks in the resolution process what are the stages of delay we we noticed that there are delays in admission how to improve those processes there are delays at various stages how to improve is it an infrastructure issue is it a policy issue is it a, a problem with the act problem with the regulations compliance issues what all that for taking all those decisions we require data then stakeholder specific issues like interim finance judicial delays inter creditor disputes avoidance applications etc so all this also in, helps us in making policy intervention now coming to the post resolution uh, phase some examples could be analysis of pre and post insolvency resolution production and revenue levels analysis of bank financing in the post resolution phase uh, analysis of the capex the data repository of mca nclt ibbi can also be used to generate insights for new credit appraisal thereby contributing to the objective of orderly credit growth in the economy now what is our vision for the future as mca we we intend to integrate the data across different system that i've just spoken to you about with one it platform for the entire ibc process what are the issues that we have identified in the present system there are multiple it platforms the systems are in silos there is no interconnectivity no interoperability and everyone uses different technology there is uh, and they are restricted by individual institutional mandates there duplicity of data different data structures multiple reporting channels and formats and the, there is a limitation in processability of these data so what is our vision at mca we look at digital first e governance we are looking for technological solutions and capabilities for autopilot surveillance system system driven compliance checks seamless data in dissemination which is very important for the researchers here we look for it to be uh, we look for advanced technological solutions ai machine learning etc to ensure that the data is available mined and helping us in all the policy interventions analytical uh, platform we also look at business intelligence which would be able to help us identify where the flaws in the system are and probably correct them we have proposed uh, a case management system for the ip which has the entire process of uh, resolution uh, process and at each of the stages which i will not repeat for the lack of time but at each of the date uh, stages we expect the data to be captured into the system be made available to ibbi to mca to nclt to uh, enable us to take policy calls then for the adjudicating authority though there is an e court system it is still not fully in use so we are looking at uh, making this fully functional integrated along with the ibbi and the mca database now what are the advantages that we are looking at and we hope to achieve there shall be one single source of truth across the insolvency and bankruptcy process 
and there would be an availability of real time and analytical dashboard for the data driven uh, decision and policy making access to the state of art ecosystem built on security and privacy design principle notification alert as per the predefined ibc processes and the associated timelines we also are looking at probably at a later date developing a software a mobile app which could be on the uh, system on the phones of the ips or the debtors etc to see where the case is standing i mean this is very futuristic but yes we are looking at that availability of audit history and the log of all the transactions an efficient system for consistency reliability and minimum repetitive data information it has to be of course very transparent we hope to leverage blockchain technology use artificial intelligence use big data for data mining and use internet of things so this is what we hope that we should be able to achieve maybe one two years down the line so with these few words thank you very much for giving me this yeah. opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Nita. I think this is fascinating to hear the kind of uh, vision they have. I think uh, like in many other sectors, we can leapfrog the Western world, at least in data. So I want to bring in Mr. Sandeep now. Um, just want to ask the organizers, can we have five extra minutes or is 10.45 or hard, hard stop? 10.45, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So maybe um, Sandeep, if you can come in and talk a little bit about IBBI, and I just want at least five to six minutes for questioning from the audience, so that you know at least we have some interaction. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, IBB is a regulator uh, which has all functions. It has legislative functions, uh, executive functions of monitoring the insolvency professionals and also the processes. And that also has quasi-judicial functions. Uh, it acts as a disciplinary authority for insolvency professionals. And uh, in all, uh, while performing all these functions, it uh, uh, collects a lot of data and uh, uh, it, um, uses them in its processes. And uh, it also has a mandate for getting the research done and framing the policy as per the uh, research outputs. So, uh, as a data provider, so one of the uh, one main functions we have, we have a research division, and uh, that division basically publishes a quarterly newsletter, uh, which contains a lot of data. Uh, it's almost 34 tables are there. It is available in PDF form as well as an Excel sheet. So that uh, has about 35 tabs in which data is available. And this is like every quarter by the end of next month or around the by the end of the next month or the end of the quarter, you have this newsletter uh, giving the data up to the end of the quarter. So now we have the data available up to the December quarter. Uh, available in the public domain. Uh, so, uh, different kinds of users require data with different degrees of rigor, and uh, this data is required for decision making for our policy interventions required by, by academia and by the professionals as well as by the operational stakeholders. So, we have data like public announcements, etc. Uh, which is posted on our website and uh, like if we miss anything or anything happens we do get calls that okay this data has not been coming uh, immediately so uh, it's a proof that stakeholders are looking for this data and utilizing this data 
and then uh, data published is being used by the media as well. So uh, we have an information base of uh, rigorous evidence uh, generated efficiently as a retween part of our functions and it is made available in a timely manner uh, so that we can construct effective interventions. Uh, data on corporate insolvency resolution process, it's one of the main set of data which is available. And uh, basically there are three, three main sets of data you can say. One is the corporate insolvency resolution process data. Then we have liquidation and voluntary liquidation processes data. And then we have data related to insolvency professional, that service providers, insolvency professionals and registered valuers. So we have data around them. Uh, the data is basically we have uh, at present the unique identifier as SIN, uh, corporate identification number. Uh, but uh, with the recent budget announcement, now we will collect PAN also. And PAN we have in fact collected for most of the uh, processes which are going on. So we will have this common business identifier. NESL also has uh, PAN in their system. So data can be linked. Our data and their data can easily be linked through PAN uh, in all cases. Uh, uh, NCLT data, uh, some of this, this is this is a missing part in today's session. We are, nobody is speaking about NCLT data. So NCLT data is also there. Uh, problem with NCLT data is that it does not capture PAN and it is very difficult to link. Uh, and we internally are trying to and trying to do an exercise of linking our data with NCLT data, finding it difficult because uh, with party names, the linking has not been that uh, uh, easy for us. Uh, so trying to make an exercise regarding this. So this is uh, out of the 35 tables which we disseminate through our newsletter, some of it I have tried to show what kind of data we are basically presenting in our newsletter. So it has the name of the company, then uh, uh, whether defunct, whether it was defunct or not at the time when it uh, insolvency was initiated. Then what is the date of commencement of corporate insolvency resolution process? And then what was the date of approval of resolution plan? Uh, whether the this insolvency was initiated by the debtor himself corporate debtor himself or the financial creditor or the operational creditor. And then we have what was the amount of uh, total admitted claims, amount of liquidation value of the assets of the company which when it uh, came into insolvency, what was the fair value of those assets, what is the total realizable value which has happened as a result of resolution, then uh, admitted claims, then realizable value as a percentage of admitted claims, as a percentage of liquidation value, as a percentage of fair value. Uh, then we have data in respect of uh, withdrawals which happen uh, during corporate insolvency resolution process. So we have details of the orders, claims and settlement. Uh, but uh, they, this data set is not exactly what we want. So we are probably, we are thinking of introducing a form which needs to be filled with, before uh, a CRP was drawn. Uh, then form filings. Uh, uh, so what is the source of all this data? All this data is being collected basically by the uh, uh, CRP forms which are filled by insolvency professionals depending on each stage of the process. So when we, they complete one stage of the process, then they file uh, details of all the data related to the process which has already happened. Then data, we have data on liquidation and voluntary liquidation. Uh, again, unique identifier here is SIN and uh, LLPIN. Uh, we have data disaggregated by NCLT bench, geographically distributed, age-wise, professional-wise. And uh, forms for this, so at present we are collecting uh, data, uh, uh, we don't have online forms, we collect data in Excel, et cetera, in respect of liquidation and voluntary liquidation. But the forms similar to CIRP are under development. In fact, we are thinking of uh, 
revising even the crp forms we want to do a more modular approach because people have uh, insolvency professionals have given us feedback that they are finding it difficult uh, to sometimes fit their data into forms like one process has happened and another process has been installed because of a stay order or anything so now they are in a fix whether they should file that form because that form requires data of two processes to be submitted so one process has been completed other process has not been completed so what should they do that kind of a thing so we're thinking that for each process we will design a form if the process is repetitive like we are capturing the data in respect of a meeting of a committee of creditors so probably that data will have to be repetitively captured uh, for each coc meeting which is conducted uh, so this is the sort of sample data uh, for the liquidation process when uh, when the liquidation happens and uh, outcome is dissolution or closure for liquidation date uh, come uh, capture similar details as that uh, in the corporate insolvency resolution process at what were the claims what was the outcome how much claims were uh, basically uh, realized and how much claims were satisfied so data in respect of uh, dissolution for voluntary liquidation uh, similar kinds of data are captured for dissolution process as well then we have data on insolvency professionals uh, their unique identifier is their registration number uh, we have data in respect of their profile details age location professional qualifications affiliations the work experience and uh, the continuing professional education uh, on the kind of courses they have taken for them for uh, capacity development then uh, the details of assignments what assignments have been completed what are ongoing assignments uh, data about authorization for assignment their fees their earnings and uh, now we have also made a is this uh, working uh, internet is working no problems so <coughs> So this is the uh, kind of uh, 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 screener we have developed for uh, for uh, uh, helping the creditors, uh, whoever wants to initiate insolvency, to select the insolvency professional. So you can choose a particular sectors. If you are you want uh, a, a professional who has worked in construction or real estate kind of industry, then uh, depending on the location where where the CD is located. Then the the types of the claim amount which the those pro, pro, uh, insolvency professionals have handled, and uh, the types of processes they have handled. So based on that, you can find out the insolvency professionals which have basically uh, undertaken they, those kinds of assignments earlier, and uh, then that definitely can help you in uh, uh, focusing or searching out insolvency professionals. So this is uh, then uh, we we want to add many more things in this. So probably the performance of the insolvency professional, like the kind of uh, resolution amount he was able to get with reference to liquidation value, the kind of bids, the resolution plans he was able to obtain uh, for a for the company. So uh, this kind of data we are thinking of adding or uh, adding. So thank you very much, and you can yeah uh, take some questions. Yeah, I think if there are I, any doubts. Yeah, we don't have too many uh, minutes left. So if I can open it up to the audience, a few questions. Um, yeah, ma'am, please. I can give you my own mic. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one suggestion. Yeah, uh, we are talking about data-driven. Research. I would like to go one step further, saying that data-driven, technology-driven insolvency process. We are talking about this. This uh, code is basically a time-bound process. It is there in the objectives itself. And the judiciary many times have told me that this is a summary proceedings. Now today, what? There's an NESL. 
where which is looking at the default, whether there's a debt, whether it's due, whether it's a default. So when that is the case, when the process says that there's a 14 days timeline for the approval, I mean admission of a case, and it is vouched by an agency, already government approved agency, the judiciary need not have 14 days time. 14 minutes time is required to admit the case. Same way, same way, the entire process, this is the only law in the country where the code, code gives the, the policy is given in the code. Then there are regulations which details the full process. There's a timeline for us being an insolvency professional or for the policy, for the court or anyone. There's a time for each process. When it is so, I think, you know, today we are, what is happening today, we are allowing anybody to everybody to interfere at any point of time into the process. Based on the data. No, no, I know. I'm talking about the Just given that we don't have too much time. Yes. I think you should take it as a different Just one second. Yeah. I feel the entire process has to be technology driven so that, you know, even the court time can be uh, saved and we can make it a truly a data data driven process that's what absolutely I think that's Thank you very much. excellent point i think data should be drive a lot of uh, things including the process itself i'll just uh, clarify that the recent colloquium which we had and what discussion paper mca has brought in the last date was uh, to give the comments for 7th rep all those points are being taken uh, care of by way of uh, almost making it mandatory to the adjudicating authority to admit the applications once a IU certificate is there. Thank you. Of time, can I just ask you to ask a question the following Because I think we might have to catch up. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, adding yeah. to Sir's point, basically on this line, MCA has thinking of a technology platform. Uh, they are thinking of facilitating the insolvency professionals by uh, providing a platform for running cases so and integrate all the uh, integrate all the processes thank you sandeep sorry yeah one last question i think can you take it out sir yeah Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very second question. So actually, thank you. I want to thank the panelists for giving us an exposure to the data that's collected. I hope uh, some of us will use it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We thank the esteemed speakers for sharing their pensive vision and giving us all the intellectual nourishment. Now, uh, may I now request Professor Jaydev, I am Bangalore, to kindly present a memento to Mr. Jayanti Prasad, full-time member IBBI. I request the Executive Director, Mr. Ritesh Kavadia, to kindly present the memento to Ms. Anita Shah Kela. I request Mr. Santosh Shukla, Executive Director IBBI, to kindly present a memento to Mr. Devjyoti Re Chaudhary. I request Mr. Amit Pradhan, Executive Director IBBI, to kindly present a memento to Mr. Sandeep Garg. I request Mr. Santosh Shukla, Executive Director IBBI, to kindly present the memento to Professor Venkatesh Panchapagish. Thank you. I request the paper presenters to kindly fill in the consent and claim form. The forms can be collected from the registration desk outside the auditorium and can be submitted after filling in to the registration desk.